show that discrimination exists. It, the idea of, of these experimental studies is not to show the, how pervasive discrimination is, but to show that discrimination does exist and it's possible to actually get at discrimination if you measure it correctly or measure it in innovative ways. Um, increasingly also there's a focus on surveys of attitudes. So attitudes and perceptions around discrimination. If you think women should not get a job when jobs are scarce because women's place is in the home and it should be the male breadwinner that should get the job, chances are the male breadwinner will be getting the job even at the macro level. So micro level attitudes that are measured of people, people's attitudes that are measured through these attitudinal surveys, um, that we are seeing a good relationship between these attitudes and actual labor market outcomes uh, that, are, uh, that are related. And we, we have a whole discussion of that in the social inclusion report as well. Um, finally, you know, there are qualitative methods, and I think that they really haven't got as much traction in, um, in the labor market. They haven't got as much traction in looking at discrimination in the labor market because they are too often thought of as being fuzzy. But in fact, um, qualitative studies really allow you to contextualize the, the way in which discrimination can take place. And what we're arguing in this, what I'm trying to argue in this, in this background paper, is it's really a triangulation of these multiple, uh, multiple techniques that allows us to get at discrimination. So it's very difficult for one of these techniques to be able to either establish or to be able to understand in a particular labor market what is really going on and whether there is a discrimination in that particular sector, that occupation, or that particular labor market. Um, and also, it's the combination of techniques is actually really important for one other re reason, is that if you are going to make or if you're going to lobby for changes in policy, or if you're going to be lobbying for, as Marty just, just showed, if you're going to be lobbying for um, changes in laws, changes in policies, the chances are there's going to be a lot of pushback on, where, on how you measure discrimination. And that pushback often is you're able to get around that pushback precisely through these triangulated studies. And I know the work you know, that Wego did uh, years ago, I mean, this is the fact that they started lobbying for some of these things. Years of work went on before that to be able to show that, yes, indeed, there is discrimination that exists. And then the lobbying started. So um, from, from a political standpoint, it's really important not to rely on one technique and to be able to triangulate. Um, then we look at, you know, discrimination in what? So um, classic decomposition techniques actually have an outcome variable that is wages. And uh, this morning's plenary, as well as uh, Marty's presentation, showed that for the most part, you know, the in informal sector is so large in some of these countries, and Marty's, um, Marty's um, graph or um, slide actually showed that, that it's not wages that you're talking about. If you have wages as an outcome of interest, you're only looking at a certain type of a labor market. You're only looking at the formal labor market where there are, where there are salaried or wage workers. What about that large labor market for the most part? Part where people are self-employed, or they're employed in casual labor, or they're not counted for one way or another, that could be to the tune of 80% of a, a labor market. Um, so other than wages, even in the formal labor market, there is increasing work that's taking place in, on promotions. So this, in, this work on glass ceilings, for instance, really takes a look at you know, whether there is discrimination in promotions. And in a, in a different paper, so Pooja Datta and I have, have argued that you know it's not just glass ceilings, it's also glass walls. So it's basically occupational mobility that is also constrained by discrimination. And there is a systematic way in which certain people are typed into certain occupations. And it's very difficult to be horizontally mobile, just as it, it is difficult to be vertically mobile. And there are ways of actually getting at some of that. It's not possible to show discrimination, but when you see systematic group characteristics that are in certain occupations, you tend to wonder why. And that's all we say is, you know, ask why these people tend to be overrepresented in certain occupations. Um, then there is, so that's, that's the issue around um, mobility. And increasingly, there are studies that look at a hierarchy of employment types. So rather than looking at just wages, or rather than looking at just vertical mobility, you look at, in a labor market, what are preferred employment types. And for the most, most part, salaried work is a preferred, preferred employment type. There could be self-employment, self-employment in agriculture, in non-agriculture, 
or casual work. Um, for women in certain, um, certain cultures, but particularly in the Middle East and in South Asia where female labor force participation is so low, what we argue is that it's not wages, it's not promotions, it's not even occupation, it's entry that is the big barrier. So entry into the labor market is where the big um, uh, disc where discrimination takes place and that discrimination needn't necessarily be at the level of, level of the labor market, it could be at the level of the household. Okay, so how does it play out? Um, and, and this is what uh, the major part of this background paper is, 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 about, is about practices and, and processes. And, and what we're saying is that, you know, it's not a planned conspiracy. For the most part, the code of discrimination and the processes of discrimination are considered truisms because they are so ingrained in what Marty mentioned, mindset, which is what uh, Ila Bhatt uses quite, quite often. They're ingrained in the mindset of both the hiring authorities, but also of household also household labor supply decisions, not just demand, is household labor supply decisions are also very, very um, attuned to a certain normative structure by which certain people do certain kinds of jobs. And so this code of discrimination is actually a hidden code. Um, has a strong cultural dimension, has a strong temporal dimension, so it changes. Women did enter the labor force, and so change, change happened. And we take a look at how women entered the labor force in the United States, for instance, and what happened after World War II that allowed more and more women to enter the labor force. When earlier, um, the norm was of the stay-at-home mom, how did that change, and how did more women enter into the labor force? So yes, this changes, and it, the, this temporal dimension becomes really important. Um, we also look at what happens in tight labor markets. So when jobs or when good jobs are few, who is getting these jobs? And what's the extent to which this normative structure actually mirrors the outcomes in the, in the job market? And I'm going to show you some, a couple of interesting uh, graphs that we've, we've done for the social inclusion report. But the, the background paper also talks about a new work that's taking place that looks at you know, things like beauty. Um, beauty, looks, so there are these experimental studies where people are asked to, uh, people put their, um, the photographs, are, they're asked to attach a, a passport size photograph to the application. And then um, you're asked to look at these photographs, um, so completely unrelated people are asked to look at these photographs, and they say, okay, do you think so-and-so is attractive or not attractive? So there's an attractive pile and a not attractive pile, and then you go back and see who was actually called for the interview. That for certain jobs, now not always attractive people get called. For certain jobs, attractive people are called, and for or, or what are considered attractive people are called, and for certain jobs, unattractive people are called. And so there's definitely this the increasing work on looks that is, but and there's a lot more on you know social background and how social background is gleaned. Um, at what stage that does discrimination play out? It's probably at the stage of um, at the at the shortlisting stage and at the interview stage. Um, this could take long, so I'm not going to go into it. It's basically what are the types of processes of of uh, discrimination, and it's not always clear. It could be conscious or unconscious. It could even be legal. Discrimination may well be legal. So, for instance, uh, different retirement ages for men and women in in many um, in many Soviet countries and in many um, uh, so, I'm sorry in East Asian countries that are still. So China, for instance, Vietnam, for instance, women and men in the civil service have different retirement ages. And it's ostensibly to protect women, but in fact there's a huge outcry of by women in the civil service protesting against their lower reti retirement ages. But it's legal. Um, then again, there are these filters. So this is what I wanted to show you. This is, um, this is a question in the World Value Survey which says men have more right to jobs when jobs are scarce. And um, as you would expect, um, well, as you would expect, yes, in, in OECD countries, very few people tend to think that, um, that, that uh, men have more right to jobs than women. But in um, Middle East, countries in the Middle East and in South Asia, a lot more people think that the breadwinner is the male, and so they have more right to jobs than, than women. Um, this is another um, question from the World Value Survey, which says, you know, I don't want an immigrant as a neighbor. 
and again there is you know we we actually plot the these attitudes against actual stock of immigrants and there seems to be a, a positive relationship there's a very strong positive relationship in this one between attitudes of people saying they don't they don't think women should get the jobs and actual female labor force participation there's a very strong relationship okay so change happens and um, i think you can uh, you know we can talk in the in the discussion later on how this change can be brought about. So change happens both through, um, through policy, through state actors, non-state actors, but also driven by um, excluded groups themselves. And I think um, the earlier presentation by Marty actually talked about um, the lobbying either for excluded groups or by excluded groups or discriminated groups. Um, you know, this, there's both collective action as well as third party lobbying for these um, discriminated groups. So change happens through a, di a series of different ways, but change happens. Um, it may happen towards discrimination or it may happen against discrimination, um, but it can be influenced. So there was the last slide, but I'm going to. Let that go, it's too busy. Thank you, Mentri. OECD um, did a survey of employers several years ago uh, in the preparation of their uh, book study on mental health issues and employment. And they asked employers uh, whether they would hire somebody with a mental health condition. And nine, over 90% of employers said no. However, those that had previous experience uh, with someone, hiring someone, or working with someone who had a mental health condition, 90% said yes. So exposure. maybe yeah. exposure yeah. shows something. And then uh, we had several months ago a panel here uh, with people with disabilities to talk about their experience. And there was one very high level uh, policy advisor in this country who, when he started talking, the first thing he said that he had a mental health condition. And then he told us about his experience when he was interviewing for one of the um, uh, civil society organizations, which focusing on the mental uh, mental uh, health people with mental health issues, right? Uh, then. When he told that he, during the interview that he had a bipolar disorder, he said that he could almost feel the discomfort and concern. So oh, it's a very sensitive issue. Thanks, Mitri, for pointing that out. And our last presentation for today, anti-discrimination laws and work in the developing world, Sandra Friedman. Um, hello, and um, thanks again to, to Dean and Benedict and World Bank for hosting the session and for, for hosting me. I'm very glad to be here. So um, my background paper was on anti-discrimination laws and work in the developing world. Um, and the, the, the focus was to look at laws and how we could, des what kind of laws there are, but also how we could design laws better to deal with anti-discrimination. So it starts with the theme of the um, World Development Report on Jobs, which is that jobs is the pivot of these three themes, productivity, living standards, and social cohesion. And we've already heard from the previous two speakers the ways in which discrimination can impact on all of these things. And clearly, if people are excluded from the labor market, they clearly have a drop in living standards. Or if they have poor quality jobs, um, it interferes with productivity by excluding potentially productive workers, but also making workers at work less productive. And because it causes hatred, prejudice, violence, it can seriously interrupt social cohesion. Um, so what um, um, so what I what we tried to do, well what I tried to do in this background paper was to look at what kind of laws there are and how they can address it. And the first thing to do is to understand discrimination from a legal perspective. And we had some interesting conversations about what discrimination means from a legal perspective. Um, and it's clear that it's broader than the pure labor market idea, which is that discrimination is only about outcomes which can't be attributed to differential productivity. And um, the previous, we've seen in the previous talk as well, 
how we can understand discrimination in a, in a much broader sense. So what, what I looked at in the report was four dimensions of discrimination. The one is de jure, that is, it is quite extraordinary how in the developing world and in the developed world, there are still um, express legal provisions which are discriminatory, and I'll give some examples shortly. Um, a second one is straightforward unequal treatment. We don't hire people over a certain age. We don't hire um, Afro-Brazilian workers. Um, we've heard we don't hire people with disabilities. But more sophisticated are where you treat everyone equally, but in fact you have an unequal impact because of previous disadvantage, such as educational or violence or other um, obstructing, other barriers to employment. And finally, and probably the most difficult, which we've already talked about as well, are institutional or systemic factors. So when we are looking at law and anti-discrimination laws, the very first thing we have to do is look at law itself, what is in the law which is discriminatory. And then we have to look quite holistically, not just at the labor market, but also at pre-labor market um, reasons for exclusion, pre-labor market barriers such as barriers in education, access to credit, property and family, the way in which the family structure works, and that's particularly true for women. And then finally, we need to look also at the labor market. Um, so, in summary, um, before I, this is the summary before I expand on the various points. Um, what is obvious is that many people are unable to access decent work because of their status, that is because of something um, to do with who they are, and this is an impediment to the three uh, thematic points in the World Development Report. Um, but basically, and this comes from the OECD, anti-discrimination laws, if well designed, can be effective in reducing labor market discrimination. And what you need, first and foremost, is de jure equality. You need protection from violence, and this is still very widespread. And then you also need sophisticated anti-discrimination laws, which have a comprehensive coverage, and I'll come to that because we've already been talking about the informal sector. And finally, we need strong implementation, which include proactive duties and incentives. Now, of course, much of this is not yet found anywhere in the, in the world, least of all in, in the countries which we looked at, but it's patchily we can find some of it. Um, just very briefly, the report, because in law you have to be jurisdiction specific and look at the developing world as a whole. So we looked at lower income countries, Kenya, Bangladesh and Nepal, lower middle income countries, India, the Philippines and Zambia, and upper middle income countries. And the, the background, in the background paper, I also looked at international constitutional, statutory, and customary law. So, so that was the coverage. Um, um, one of the things which was very salient, as I said, is how much de jure or formal inequality there is still. Um, straightforward exclusion from basic legal protection, which includes violence, lack of access to property, lack of access to justice, lack of access to credit, particularly so for sexual orientation. It remains a criminal offense. Um, sodomy remains a criminal offense in 80 countries. Actually, that's just reduced probably. Um, but, and, but even so, there are restrictions on marriage, immigration, adoption, pensions, work-related benefits, and social security benefits, although you would have seen that France just passed a law um, legalizing gay marriage, same-sex marriage, in the last couple of days. Um, there are also very widespread de jure forms of discrimination against women, and this is particularly true in the countries in which I looked at in the form of customary and personal laws and practice. So customary law is often condoned by the Constitution and is outside of any constitutional legal guarantee. So it's condoned in the sense that um, even if it's uh, biased in, in, in relation to sex, it's not uh, illegal under the Constitution. 
And these are some of the examples which were condoned or even legal in the various countries which I looked at, child marriage, polygamy, male legal guardianship of unmarried women, property grabbing from the widow by the family of the deceased, sexual cleansing, discriminatory personal laws, which are religious laws on marriage, divorce, and custody, and male primogenitor for succession and unequal inheritance rights for daughters. So if we're thinking about discrimination impeding jobs, all of these things are out of the labor market, but they are serious uh, and perhaps total obstacles to participation in the labor market. Um, we do see some progress. So in terms of designing laws, we do see some progress towards including um, customary law within the constitution. And you see this in the Zambian draft constitution, which says that all laws, customary or regulatory, that permit or have the effect of discriminating against women are void. You'd be surprised that this is only a draft constitution, but it's still happening. The Philippines has recently agreed a very wide-reaching Magna Carta for women, which isn't legally binding, but has um, a lot of very interesting policy initiatives. The new constitution of Kenya, like the Zambian draft one, says that laws such as, which include customary law, which are inconsistent with the constitution, are invalid. Um, in South Africa, a recent case in the last four or five years found that the customary rule of primogenitor was invalid. That's the Bear case. And in a really interesting case in Botswana, so Botswana, as I said, excludes customary law from its constitutional equality protection. But in a very recent case, the court nevertheless managed to find that discriminatory succession laws were unconstitutional. This case, though, is going on appeal, and according to the judge in the first instant case, he's quite pessimistic, so it might still be overturned. But at least it shows, um, as, um, as we've heard, that you can have change, and particularly legal change is what we need to be working for, first and foremost, is getting rid of de jure discriminatory laws. Um, then, of course, there's violence, and whether it's violence in the street, violence on the way to work, violence in the family, or sexual harassment at work, you won't get productive workers when, when there is discriminatory violence. And yet it's very widespread. This is true for violence against women, true for violence against ethnic groups, which is very widespread in the Czech Republic, which is one of the countries I looked at. Clearly we have a lot of homophobic violence, and this is exacerbated by poverty and armed conflict. And what I think came out of the report is that it's not if only effective legislation we need. We need effective implementation because much of the implementation was itself discriminatory. So we've heard about street traders having discriminatory ways of uh, implementing laws which are there. Um, so quite, quite important, extremely important is the way, are the ways in which existing criminal laws are implemented. And the same is true for domestic violence sexual harassment at work laws, and so on. Um, now, we've heard a lot. So if we've got de jure, if we've dealt with de jure um, discrimination, the next thing we need to look at is how we deal with labor market discrimination. And in order to design effective laws to address labor market discrimination, we clearly need to understand, and we've heard a lot of fa fascinatingly from the previous paper, about discrimination in the labor market. Um, so I won't go into that, um, but what I will then talk about is how, what sort of law we should be looking for to address this. And I'm looking at design of law rather than impact per se. So the first question is we need a constitutional guarantee. And it's most of the states that in, in the survey did have a constitutional guarantee. But as I said, some of them exempt personal laws or customary laws. But they are limited because they usually bind only the state. So they are vertically uh, enforceable, but not horizontally. So you also need legislation. You need sex, race, and other anti-discrimination statutes um, because those will bind private bodies. But what we find in the various countries in which I looked at was that there it's unusual to find a holistic uh, 
piece of legislation. Some of them are sector specific. That is, for example, only in employment and not in housing. Some of them are strand specific that they might look at sex, they might look at race, but they don't see the interaction. And as I mentioned, some are non-binding as the Filipina Magna Carta. Um, the next question when looking at the design of legislation is to decide who is protected. And we've seen again from the previous paper that who are the groups which are, are protected can vary very widely. Um, and what I just charted in this slide is how frequently different groups appear in anti-discrimination legislation. And you'll see from this that sex, race, religion and ethnic origin are the most common ones, the ones at the bottom are the most common to be protected. Disabil um, language, marital status, nationality are next, then disability, age and political opinion. And the newest and the best statutory instruments will cover this whole list. So the South African one, the Kenyan one are quite long. But the very un most unusual or the rarest are pregnancy, HIV, poverty, and still very rare, um, surprisingly, perhaps not surprisingly, but very glaringly, um, it's rare to have sexual orientation protected. Um, so the next question is what kind of, what are the definitions of discrimination we find in statute and what should we find? So we, oh yes, sorry, I should have mentioned the very important point about intersectionality which is what do we do if we have a combination of these groups? And the bottom line is that it's, in law, it's been very difficult to address intersectional discrimination. For example, discrimination against Dalit women, against um, disabled people of particular ethnic origin, and so on. So what do we want to see in the, in the law? Well, the legal definitions match the kind of point that I made earlier once we've got de jure out of the way. We want a, a definition which addresses prejudice, straightforward prejudice in the workforce, which we might call outlawing direct discrimination. But that's not enough because a lot of the discrimination is systemic and it might be, there might be equal treatment with a disparate impact. So we need indirect discrimination laws or disparate impact. Taking this further, we need laws which actually require change to accommodate those who are different, as in disability or religion. Um, particularly important for women, but also for other groups, are equal pay for work of equal value. Much newer and still very experimental, but existing, are proactive duties which require bodies to take, to initiate steps to change rather than waiting for complaints. And you know from the states and other places that affirmative action is a central point, but very controversial. In India, actually, the main thrust of anti-discrimination legislation is through the reservation policy. Um, so this should have come out as a pyramid. I don't know why it looks like this. Um, that's odd, but anyway. It should have come out as a pyramid, which showed that um, what was most prevalent. So the statutes which had any discriminatory provisions tended to have only direct discrimination. So the red one at the bottom is the last one. That's really odd. Does it come out? Um, anyway, um, where so countries like Botswana, Nepal might only have direct discrimination. Other countries, particularly those who've signed up to the ILO Convention might require equal pay for equal work moving along, but few will require, so moving from that side this way, few will require um, equal pay for work of equal value. And yet, if you are really going to address discrimination against women in the pay, uh, in relation to pay, you need to go beyond the same work and talk about work of equal value. So countries like Jamaica, South Africa would have equal pay for the same work, but not equal pay for work of equal value. Um, it's less common to have indirect discrimination, but more recent uh, statutory provisions, such as those in Kenya, would include it. And of course, the Czech Republic, because it mirrors, I'm nearly done, it mirrors the um, EU would have indirect discrimination. 
Much less usual is reasonable accommodation, but the Czech Republic, Kenya, again, has it. And as I said, some countries, um, like India, put everything on affirmative action. Proactive duties can be found in Brazil, Kenya, and South Africa. And finally, oh, well, very briefly, because we've already talked about the informal sector, but what I just wanted to very briefly point to you is from the legal side, that you may have sophisticated anti-discrimination laws, but they really are of no use if they exclude these very wide, huge swathes of workers in the informal sector. And these are, and we can talk more afterwards because we're out of time, but these are ways in which legislation tends to exclude the informal sector. It refers only to employees. It might exclude short-term or casual workers, agency workers, contracted out workers. There may be blatant exclusions, such as for domestic workers, export zones, migrant workers. Unpaid work, such as homework, voluntary work, or family work might be excluded. There may be no trade unions and enforcement is difficult. So the real challenge for, for statutory discrimination law is that whenever you have exclusions, you have an incentive to avoid regulation. And so the bottom line is that it needs to be comprehensive. It needs to address all workers, uh, all employers, and so uh, avoid that incentive. And finally, we need accessible adjudication um, alternative dispute resolution, we need labour inspectors who are properly resourced, um, and in many of these countries we have very little of these. So in the end, if we want to really address um, discrimination through law, we need laws, we need to get rid of de jure prohibitions, we need protection from violence, and we need sophisticated anti-discrimination laws with strong implementation. So thank you very much, and sorry to have rushed the end of it.